ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله العظيم من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد يحيي ويميت وهو حي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله ادى الامانه وبلغ الرساله ونصح للامه وكشف الغمه وتركنا على المحجه البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها الا هالك فعليه افضل الصلاه واتم التسليم وعلى اله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته الى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين رب العالمين واوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل وقد امرنا بالحق وقال تعالى يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ثم اما بعد we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declare his perfection and declare that none has the right to be worshiped or unconditionally obeyed except for him subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask him to send his peace and blessings upon his final messenger muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his family his companions and those that follow until the day of judgment and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst them allahumma ameen dear brothers and sisters it's obviously no secret that what the ummah is going through right now is a very unique phase. The conflict that we see taking place in the Middle East today is one that is very different from the conflict that it seemed to be a year ago or two years ago. The conflict that truly puts aside those who believe from those who are hypocrites. A conflict that truly purifies this ummah from its filth and shows those that are truly going to stand for the truth and those that will truly stand with their principles whenever they are tested and that will not relent to wealth or fame or bribes for anything and will not leave their deed for anything and will not leave justice for anything and many times when we're sitting here in the west in our comfortable homes and we're seeing what's happening in egypt we're seeing what's happening in syria in palestine in bangladesh in iraq in afghanistan in Somalia, in Ethiopia, in Uganda. I mean, you can go on and on. You can go all the way to China. And you will find that there's blood, that there's transgression against Muslims. And one of the major issues that we have is that in the West, as Muslims, what we've become is nothing more than political commentators. You know, the way that we find ourselves attached to our brothers and sisters is that we go online and we just keep commenting on the issue offering our commentary in our comfortable gatherings, at our Ramadan iftars perhaps, in our dinner gatherings, we offer our commentary. But with that, there is very little dua, there is very little supplication for our brothers and sisters. And there is another component that I feel like is missed more than anything else. And that is the failure to acknowledge our own role in contributing to the appearance of dhulm on a global scene of transgression and oppression. Al which is something that's very interesting because by looking at the TV sometimes we fail to look at the mirror anymore. We see a Zalim who's a president, who's a prime minister, who's a king. We see a Zalim who's a Zalim who's a transgressor and an oppressor to you know millions and millions of people, and we forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us for the dhulm that we have made that we may have committed to one individual. And that on the day of judgment, that one, that transgression that I may have committed towards one individual will mean a lot more to me than the one that has happened to three million or four million people because that's me. That's something that I'm responsible for. And I can't complain about other people's look if I, if me myself, I am responsible. And the Prophet وسلم, has not, you know, he, he has not neglected this topic. He's spoken about this topic in many different ways. And very simple, the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna dhulma, that verily dhulm, which means oppression, transgression, is dhulmat. 
is darkness upon darkness upon darkness on the Day of Judgment. Because the number one rule on the Day of Judgment is La ظُلْمَ الْيَوْمِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow anyone to be wrong. That there will not be a shred of injustice. Not even the injustice between animals will be overlooked on the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call each and every single one of us to account for the injustices that we may have committed. And that's something that we should all be afraid of. And there's a hadith Qudsi, which is something when the Prophet ﷺ narrates from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outside of the capacity of revelation, meaning outside of the capacity of Qur'an. Very powerful hadith Qudsi, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to His servants. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibadi, O oh my servants. And there, there's so much you can go into with this hadith, because usually Allah Azza will say, Ya ibn Adam, O son of Adam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh my servants. And some of the muhaddithin, they commented on that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Ya ibadi, because there is no exclusion here. All of my ibad, all of my servants, all of my slaves, in the broader sense, those who volunteer themselves in ubudiyah by coming to salah, those who volunteer themselves in servitude by praying and by doing the things that were ob ob obligated upon them, and those that are the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether they like it or not. Ya ibadi, every single one of you, inni harramtu wulma ala nafsi. I have prohibited transgression, injustice upon myself. And I have made it between you forbidden. So do not wrong one another. This is an extremely profound hadith. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could simply say that I made dhulm haram. Inni haramtu dhulm. Transgression is forbidden now. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to do something very interesting. And Allah Azza doesn't do this with anything else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have made it haram for me. Can you imagine that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden transgression for himself. He's made it forbidden for himself. And so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden it for himself, then what about us? Who are we then to engage in these acts of transgression and justice? I'm talking about the minor ones also. I'm not talking about the major ones. Dhulm is not just killing someone in the streets. Dhulm is in business. Dhulm is in our family affairs. Dhulm is between brothers and sisters. Dhulm is in backbiting. Dhulm is in gossip and slander. Dhulm is in all of these different fields. Dhulm is not just murdering somebody. That's the greatest form of dhulm, there's no doubt. But there, is, there are many forms of dhulm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I've made it forbidden for myself. And I've made it forbidden for all of you between yourselves. So do not wrong one another. And you know what's so interesting about this hadith when Allah in, in this usage is that usually when a person finds himself, you know, or finds himself engaging in some sort of dhulm, in some sort of transgression, it's because they find themselves in a position of authority, even if that authority is truly imaginary. They think that they're in a position of authority, but they're not really in a position of authority. But it's when I find myself in authority, you know, we're very humble when we're weak. We're very humble when we're poor. But all of a sudden when the bank account starts to, you know, you start to see more figures, you start to see greater numbers. All of a sudden, when you start to gain more recognition in society, and someone talks to you in a certain way, or someone offends you, how dare you offend me? How dare you talk back to me? You know, that's the problem. It's conceived from arrogance. It's conceived from a sense of pride. You know, I think that I have the power to do this and therefore I'm going to do this. And I don't, I, I start to lose that sense of accountability to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that fear of questioning by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you're right in front of me and you're not in a position to defend yourself right now. Whether it's in backbiting and backbiting truly, Imam Qudam rahimahullah said, nothing represents cowardice more than backbiting. Only a coward backbites. Why? Because the person's not there to defend themselves. You're a coward when you backbite. Right? The person's not there to defend themselves. And when someone's in front of you and you find them weak and vulnerable and you take advantage of them, if you find someone who's very nice and lenient and you take advantage of them, it's because you, you think you have some sort of authority to do so at the moment. You know, subhanAllah, when, uh, when the senators, when McCain and Graham went to visit Egypt, 
You know, the comment that Graham, and although they're in no position to talk, the comment that he made about Cece is he said he seems intoxicated by power. You know, all of a sudden you have a sense of power and then you, you flip. You do all kinds of things. And this is a fact. This is how we are as human beings. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us that even though He is Allah and we are His slaves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden vote on Himself. And that's what the Prophet Sallallahu tried to drive home on many different occasions. He walks by alayhi salatu wasalam, one time a man who's beating a slave. And Rasulullah Sallallahu says, Allah is more capable of doing that to you than you are of doing that to him. SubhanAllah. Like, you know, you think that you have this power, you think you have this authority. Allah could do the same thing to you, but Allah doesn't do it to you. And the man said, Ya Rasulullah, I freed him for the sake of Allah. You know what the Prophet Sallallahu told him? Rasulullah said, had you not freed him, you surely would have been from the people of hell. You would have been a dweller of hellfire. And subhanAllah, why? Because you thought you had that authority. There is a kibir there, there is a pride that's involved. There is an arrogance that's involved when you wrong someone else. And that's why in our deen, because a lot of times we allow people to take advantage of our ignorance. And so they look back in history and say, Islam didn't abolish slavery. And we would say, well, Islam limited it to prisoners of war. You tell me what you would prefer, a prisoner of war going to Guantanamo or going to Abu Ghraib or going to someone's house, being dressed with the same clothes as their kids, being fed the same clothes, not even allowed to be called a slave. And the Prophet Wasallam said, if you hit one of them, then you have to free them. The only kafara, the only expiation is freedom. SubhanAllah. Can you imagine a prisoner of war and the Prophet said, if you put your hand on that person, the only kafara, the only fitting expiation is freeing that person. Because you crossed the bounds now. You put yourself in a position that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give you. Now, if that's the case with a prisoner of war, and if it's the case with an animal, that the Prophet said that a person was entered into hellfire because they forbade a dog, a thirsty dog from water. If that's the case with an animal, then what about with your own family members? What about with your wife? What about with your children? What about with your parents, which is greater than all of that? What about with your brothers and sisters? What about with humanity? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it that grave and that severe for those things, then what about us? And we really need to think about that because unfortunately a lot of times we've separated Islam from social justice. We've separated Islam from the things that we do in our, in our everyday lives. And that's why subhanAllah, you know, I ask people this all the time, why I do business with Muslims all the time. I'm sure we all do business with Muslims all the time. And I know that a lot of times we regret doing business with Muslims. Let's face it. We regret it. Why? Because there's that, he's my brother, I can take advantage of him. It happens. You know, all of a sudden, subhanAllah, the masha'Allah becomes insha'Allah. Take care of you one day. I'll pay you back. Brother, don't worry about it. I got you, I got you. Don't worry about it, brother. Subhan that person that looks so sweet in the masjid, and that person that you would have thought so greatly of, but when it comes to money, there's dhul, there's transgression. And subhanAllah, that's why Imam al-Shaybani, rahimahullah ta'ala, Abu al-Hassan, you know, the very famous scholar who wrote al-Mabsult, who wrote the encyclopedia of Hanafi Fiqh, the second of the two great students of Imam Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. And he used to constantly give lectures, used to constantly advise the people in regards to amrad al-qulub, in regards to the diseases of the heart, and in spirituality, and zuhd, and, and he was an ascetic himself, he was a zahid himself. And he was asked why he never wrote a book on amrad al-qulub, on the diseases of the heart, or, and why he never wrote a book on spirituality and tazkiyah. And he said, I have, he said, I have written a book on Tazkiyah. I have written a book on the diseases of the heart. He said, I've written Kitab al-Buyur, the book of transactions. Because the one who deals with his money with justice will deal with justice with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has a pure heart. SubhanAllah, the honest tajr, the honest businessman who will not wrong the one who walks into his business, who will not wrong his brother, either in Islam or in humanity. That person has a high has a high standard in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That person is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because they don't take advantage of people. You're in a position, but you don't do it. People trust you and you and you make sure that that trust is earned and you make sure that you honor you honor that trust. 
That person in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far greater than someone who comes to the masjid all the time, but at the same time cheats people on the outside. Why? Because we all know the hadith of the Prophet. When the Prophet said, Atadruna min al muflis, do you know who the bankrupt person is? And they said, Who is it, Ya Rasulullah? And, the, and, and you know, they actually answered the Prophet and they said, The one who has no money. That's who they thought the bankrupt person is. And Rasulullah said, No, it's the person who comes on the day of judgment. And mind you, before we even get to the second part of the hadith, the Prophet said, He comes with his salah. He used to pray. He comes with his siyam, he comes with his sadaqah, he comes with all of that. وَلَكِنْ سَبَّ هَذَا وَشَتَنَ هَذَا وَضَرَبَ هَذَا وَاخْتَابَ هَذَا He hit this person, he cursed this person, he backbited this person, he harmed this person. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally will have each and every single person that he harmed on the Day of Judgment come to him and take his good deeds from him. Until this man, can you imagine an adult? How many Ramadans has he gone through? How many prayers has he prayed? Let's say he was 20 years old and he prayed five times a day for, for six years of his life as an adult, as a mature adult. How many salawat did he pray? He gave his zakah, obviously. The Prophet ﷺ said he paid his charity. He did what he was supposed to do. And the Prophet ﷺ said he's left with absolutely no hasanat. Zero. All of his salah went to waste. All of his fasting went to waste. Until he says, Oh Allah, I don't even have any more good deeds to give away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause him to start, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause the other people, those that still have a debt, to come forward and to place their sins on his back. This man is buried in sin. Why? Because of the thulm. Because of, transaction, because of that trans transgression. Because he hurt people. We really need to think about that very, very, very seriously. Don't look at the bottom on TV. Look at the one in the mirror if you're guilty. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold you accountable for that. And you know, the, the scholars commented on men, there are so many different narrations that show us something very special about this and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds, holds this in a high standard. If I was to ask any single person in here, what is a more disgusting deed? A riba, interest and usury, or a zina, or adultery? You know, a person would say, well, adultery. You know, if someone commits adultery in the community and he's known to be a zani and adultery, he's never going to be able to show his face in the masjid again. It'll never be the same. Right? People will treat that person differently. But mashallah, when it comes to riba, there's so many people that deal in interest and we will show our faces in the masjid, we will be very active in the masjid, we'll be considered religious people. Even though the Prophet wasallam said that the lowest, the lowest of riba, the lowest of the sin of interest is like committing adultery with a person's mother 34 times. Authentic hadith. It's disgusting. That's something that we could not even perceive. And the Prophet wasallam says something to disgust us. To let us know how severe it is. Meaning, a riba is worse than a zina. And in Fulayr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu rahimahullah, he said that I would rather commit zina multiple times than be guilty of dealing with a sense in riba. Why? The only crime in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you are guilty of it, then be prepared to wage war with Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the Day of Judgment. Allah and His Messenger have declared war on you. Be prepared to take your weapons on the Day of Judgment and fight with Allah and His Messenger wasallam. The only one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever mentioned that with. Why? And Imam Al-Qurtubi rahimahullah ta'ala said, because this involves huquq al-ibad. This involves the rights of people. Riba, interest, buries people in debt. It involves taking the rights of people. And so to even witness it is more disgusting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than a zina. Because it causes people to commit suicide. It ca debt causes people to kill themselves. Debt causes people to drink alcohol. Debt causes people to commit zina and ruin their family lives. And when you are contributing to that bubble of debt that involves financial injustice, economic injustice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates that even more than zina. Because it involves al ibad, the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's servants.
And on the day of judgment, dear brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive us for many, many major sins. Major sins. Rasulullah said his shafa'a, his intercession on the day of judgment is for the major sinners of the ummah. There is hope for a person who commits a major sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive him. But the one who has wronged someone else will have to meet that person on the day of judgment. Can you imagine, subhanAllah, meeting your wife, meeting your, your wife being the obstacle to you entering paradise because of that time that you raised your hand and you hit her? A person that you did business with and for a few cheap dollars, for a few hundred dollars, those hundred dollars are keeping you away from Jannah. In fact, the Prophet said the shaheed, the martyr, is forgiven for absolutely everything. He enters Jannah without any accountability. SubhanAllah, imagine, he enters Jannah without even being asked about his deeds, except for a dain, except for his debts. Even the martyr will be asked about that. You gave your life for Allah, fine, but you took a few dollars from that person. You need to answer for those. Hajj, we don't even go to Hajj when we have dain, when we have death. And SubhanAllah, what greater dain? And Imam al-Shawkani, rahimahullah ta'ala, says something very beautiful in that regard. What greater debt does an individual have than the debt of his honor and his dignity? Don't even think about it just with money. When you've harmed that person with your tongue, when you've taken that person's honor and dignity, what greater debt than that? That's even greater than if you owe that person some money. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to hold you accountable for that and hold me accountable for that. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu said, that whoever has some sort of injustice and whoever has some sort of debt, let him go and seek forgiveness for it before he dies and he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a day when there will be no exchange of dirham and dinar. Go to that person and you say to them, I'm sorry. You say to them, I wronged you. I tried. What can I do to make it better? I don't want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this, with this debt on me. I don't want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having faced this. And subhanAllah, just think about this. You know, we can say, and a lot of times we justify our dhulm by saying, well, that person is not even that religious. I'm not worried about that person meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and complaining against me. That person is nobody. That person is not that religious. Who is that person in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the supplication of the wronged one, of the oppressed one, has no hijab, has no veil, between it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if the one making dua was a non-believer, even if a kafir was to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a non-believer was to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and complain of an injustice that you committed towards him or her, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would answer that dua. That's something we really, really need to take into account. Dear brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَنَتِ الْوُجُوهُ لِلْحَيِّ الْقَيُّومِ That on the day of judgment, the faces are presented to al-hayy, to the ever-living al-qayyum, the one who's always in charge. وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ حَمَنَ ظُلْمَ And anyone who has a bit of transaction, of transgression, anyone who has committed any injustice will fail miserably on that day, will lose. It all goes to waste. Find the people that you have wronged and make sure that you make things better. Make sure that you repair those relationships. Make sure that you pay those people back. Wallahi, if someone comes to you and says that you owe them something, and you know that they're wrong, give it to them anyway because you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could deal with us with justice. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with justice with us, then we would be in great trouble. None of us would survive that test. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to absolve us of any, of any transgression, of any injustice, whether it is a, an injustice committed against ourselves, an injustice committed against the people, and greater than that, an injustice committed against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which case we only wrong ourselves. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us and have mercy upon us. رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِنْ لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَا مِنَ الْقَاسِرِينَ أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم
Dear brothers and sisters, this hadith is one that is truly profound. Allah has forbidden transgression upon Himself. And subhanAllah, one point that I want to share with you, which was shared by a great scholar, Muhammad Amin al-Shanqiti rahimahullah ta'ala, very beautiful point. He said, if a person was to commit shirk, and by the way, this is consensus of the ulama, if a person was to curse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if a person was to be a Satan worshiper, if a person was to be an atheist, but they turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for one moment, and they said, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah, sincerely from the heart. Iman entered their heart. And they dedicated themselves to changing their lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would forgive them, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not hold anything against them. However, look at the punishments that were legislated in our sharia. One of them being al qaf which is to slander a pure person, to slander someone with adultery. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated that for the one that slanders, even if he says, I'm sorry, even if he says, I'm sorry, that that person is to be lashed 80 times. SubhanAllah. He said, look at the difference here. Look how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our sake as mankind, look how much ghira, how much honor he has for us. That he will not allow any slander he will not allow any harm, any death to go forgiven by him unless the one who was slandered, the one who was harmed forgives. Or unless you made a sincere effort to seek that person's forgiveness and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could see your sincerity. That is, the, that is the standard to which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds the honor of the believers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds the honor of his creation as a whole. Especially the mu'mineen, especially the believers. And especially those that are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, a lot of times when we start speaking about people, we might harm someone. And the beauty of our deen is that we don't have a priest, we don't have a priest caste. We don't have any hierarchy in our deen. To where you have the awliya and then you have everybody else. Those that are close to Allah, the beloved of Allah. You know, mashallah, these are the beloved of Allah. This is the wali of Allah. You know, we have these. We have people that would come out and they would say, "This is what he, he could even commit zina. He could even commit adultery, and he's forgiven for that. Nothing happens to him." All these weird things that come into our ummah. You know, when people say, "This is a wadi. This is a wadi. This is a wadi," and the Prophet said that the awliya are hidden, the hidden servants of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Mul akhtiya. They're hidden people. They're people that you wouldn't be able to tell. There are people that could be sitting amongst you and you know, he's not wearing the thobe, he's not looking very religious. A very average person, but he's a person that the Prophet ﷺ would say that this person that enters upon you, O Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Ashabi, my companions, is a person from Ahlul Jannah, is a man from the people of paradise. The one that Abdullah bin Umar who followed home for three days, doesn't pray any Qiyamul Layl. He doesn't pray at night. He doesn't fast Mondays and Thursdays. He just does what he has to do. But every single night, he removes all the grudges from his heart and he seeks forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the people that harm him. The sawali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's a, a close friend, a beloved one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah azza wa jalla says in the hadith Qudsi, man adali waliya faqad adhantuhu bil harm. You know, if you touch one of the awliya, if you harm one of those people that are close to Allah, and you don't know who they are, it could be anybody. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have waged war upon that person. Again, Allah only says He wages war out of His lira for the believers. The way that He holds the believers, the standard by which He holds the believers. We have to be extremely careful with our tongues, with our hands, with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ told Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu. In the long hadith, when Abu Dhar was asking Rasulullah for all these actions that lead to paradise, and Abu Dhar doesn't have money, he doesn't have status in society, he's not a powerful man, you know, he can't do much. He's not educated yet in the deen when he's asking the Prophet ﷺ for good things to do, he has nothing. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Look, then don't harm anybody. That's it. You've got nothing to do. 
don't harm anybody. As simple as that. And, and he says to Rasulullah Sallallahu He does that, he'll enter paradise. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, yes, he'll enter paradise. He will enter paradise just for not harming people. And I want to leave you, SubhanAllah, with, with a thought. And this is a thought that, that we have to all ask ourselves. And the first person is me. The first person is me. Many times, the greatest bulb, the greatest injustice is committed against one who commits an injustice towards you first. In the capacity of revenge, someone does something to you and so you want to get them back. It happens to a lot of us. You know, that sense of justice, shaitan boils it up and shaitan makes it much worse than justice to where you commit an injustice against the one, against the one who committed an injustice towards you. Someone backbites you and then when you know about that, you tear that person up. Someone slanders you, you slander him back. Someone takes something from you, you take more from him. Right? It's not just an eye for an eye, it's a face for an eye. You know, I'll take everything. I'll get everything back from that person. And that's really where the test of Iman and understanding where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and where you are really comes. Uthman was an 85 year old man and he twisted the ear of a young boy. You imagine a young boy, he twisted his ear to discipline him. And the young boy complained about that. And Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, this 85 year old man, bends over and gives his ear to the boy and forces him to twist his ear. And when he starts to hold his ear, after, after refusing, after hesitation, Uthman radiallahu anhu says, twist harder, make it more painful, because this is lighter than the punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. Take it from me, go ahead. How much humility does an 85-year-old billionaire who is a Khalifa, who is the leader of the Muslims, how much humility does he have to have to bring himself down and say, pinch my ear and make it hard to a little boy? Because I don't want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hold me accountable for that on the Day of Judgment. You know who he learned that from? He learned that from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Your brothers and sisters, Usayd ibn Hulayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and this hadith is one, Wallah, I have a hard time reading this hadith. I, I really have a hard time reading this hadith. Because Usayd ibn Hulayn, he says that one time there was a young man from the Ansar who was laughing uncontrollably and he was making other people laugh and he was doing it in a very inappropriate way. And the Prophet Khalqillah, the best of Allah's creation, takes his stick and he just pokes him under his ribs. Just to tell him to calm down. He didn't gash him. He didn't hurt him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He just poked him under his ribs. Like telling him, like, calm down. This is too much. And you know what Usaid says? He says, this young man said to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I want revenge. You poked me, I want my retaliation. Can you imagine, who are you? This young, insignificant man, who are you to say to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, give me my revenge. I want retaliation. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes to him. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, take your revenge. You know what makes it even more than that? The young man didn't stop there. He said, Ya Rasulullah, he said, my shirt was off, you have a shirt that's on. Rasulullah takes his shirt and he raises it up. Can you imagine that? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Can you imagine the Messenger of Allah وسلم, doing that to a young man? Poke me, take your revenge. Rasulullah doesn't want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that. With everything that he's done. He didn't say, well I'm Rasulullah, I've got a lot going for me, I can let this go and say just go away. Get it over with. Rasulullah raises his shirt. And the young man kisses the stomach of the Prophet وسلم, and hugs him and says, هذا, ya That's all I wanted, O Messenger of Allah. That's what I wanted from you, Ya Rasulullah. Dear brothers and sisters, a very simple take home message. It's not worth it. That extra few dollars is not worth it. The laughter that you will get in your conversation by backbiting is not worth it. The sense of justice and revenge that you will feel is not worth it. Nothing is worth humiliation on the Day of Judgment. 
and nothing is more precious than the good deeds on the day of judgment. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to stand with our brothers and sisters in Egypt and in Syria and all over the world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to destroy their oppressors. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them their honor and their dignity in this world and in the next. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make their dead shuhada. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise each and every single one of the dead, to raise them as shuhada. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to punish those that kill them and those that harm them and those that take their honor. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to make us amongst those that contribute to the harm that takes place on, upon our brothers and sisters. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to absolve us, to take away from us, to forgive us for any form of dhulm that we either participate in, condone, or are complacent with. Allahumma fkir lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat wal muslimin wal muslimat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat innaka sami'un qareebun mujibu da'wat Allahumma fkir lana warhamna wa'afu anna wa la tu'addibna rabbana zalamna anfusana wa in lam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lana kunanna min al-khasirin Allahumma innaka afuhu tuhibbu al-afu fa'afu anna Allahumma fkir li walidina rabbi rhamhuma kama rabbawna sigara rabbana hab lana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina kurrata a'yun wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama Allahumma sur المستضعفين في مشارق الأرض ومغاربها اللهم عليك بأعدائك أعداء دين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين وأذل الشرك والمشركين ودمر أعداء الدين اللهم أهلك الظالمين بالظالمين وأخرجنا وأخواننا من بينهم سالمين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعد والإحسان وإيتاء القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم واشكروه على نعماء يزدكم ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقيم الصلاة